everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Universe Within podcast. This episode of the show is being sponsored by the Amazonian Plant Healing Center at the Temple of the Way of Light. I've worked at the temple for about the past decade now, and I can really attest to the quality of the work that they do. They're predominantly working with the plant medicine ayahuasca, um, working within the lineage of the Shipibo people, and they run 12-day retreats. And in those 12 days, there's six different ceremonies. They work with four different uh, Shipibo doctors or healers, curanderos, uh, two to three facilitators, uh, there's a pre-ceremony yoga teacher, they work with uh, massage people, bone doctors, <clears throat> herbalists, and uh, there's an amazing uh, pre-support team, uh, a post-support integration team. So it's really an amazing place to go and to experience the, the, the magic and the, the wonder and teaching of ayahuasca. So if you're interested in working with uh, plant medicines uh, and you'd like to learn more information about the temple, you can check out their website website at templeofthewayoflight.org and I'll put a link to that in the show notes. And then myself and my colleague Marav Artsy are continuing to run dietas, which is one of the traditional ways in which people go uh, very deep into the world of plant medicines, uh, going into a period of isolation, fasting, and ingesting uh, very particular plants that have the ability to heal and to teach and to, to work on all three of these levels, the physical, the mental, emotional, and the spiritual. Um, so we'll be continuing to run diets. Uh, the next one will be in September in the Sacred Valley of Peru, and then we'll also be in the Sinai Desert of Egypt in October. And if you'd like more information about those, you can check out my website at nicotianarustica.org. Um, my guest today is a lady I met doing a mutual interview uh, a couple months ago. Her name is Kylia Tyler, uh, and she's a really beautiful woman. She's been involved in this work for a very long time, and we got a bit into her story about uh, spending time at Esalon, working with Stanislav Grof, uh, her involvement in holotropic breath work. Uh, she's now a uh, uh, a counselor and a therapist, uh, I believe specializing in, in family therapy and marriage. Um, and she wrote a wonderful book about the ethics of doing this work, of working with plants and psychedelics. Um, so she's a, a really fascinating woman, and we had a, a really beautiful conversation. So I really hope you all enjoyed this conversation. Um, as always, if you're able to support the podcast, Patreon is a really beautiful way. It's a subscription service for as little as a dollar a month. You can sign up. Uh, and with uh, signing up, you get access to different tiers. And with those come uh, added benefits, things like early access to shows, um, bonus material, Q&As. So it's a really beautiful way to help to support this podcast. Um, to all the people who have done that, to all the patrons, thank you very much. I, I really appreciate it. Um, I'll put a link to that in the show notes. There's also the option to donate directly via PayPal. I'll also put a link to that in the show notes. Um, and then if you're not able to do that, simply going on the YouTube page, subscribing to the show, turning on the notification bell, liking the video, that's a really big help with the algorithms. Uh, the YouTube channel has just uh, surpassed 1,000 subscribers, which is a, a little milestone. Um, and so, yeah, keep subscribing and getting the show out to a bigger audience. And then with the audio version going on Apple Podcasts, subscribing to the show and leaving a starred rating and a short review, that's a really big help. So I think that's it. And without further ado, here is my conversation with Kylia. Running out from the maze, running out from the maze, running out of the maze today. Running out from the maze, running out from the maze, running out from the maze today. I'm running out from the maze, running out from the maze, running out of the maze today. Well, welcome. It, it's nice to have you. Uh, we, we were talking a little bit before we started. Um, we we did a, a mutual interview together um, through a lady I know, Isabel, and I guess she reached out to you. And um, I forget. Do you remember what the topic was called? I, I can't remember now. It was ethics, yeah. <laughs> something ethics yeah. and psychedelics. I guess. 
Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so it was uh, yourself and uh, I believe in uh, another lady, a gentleman and, uh, and myself. And, um, and yeah. 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 And I, I, it was the first time I had, I had known about you or heard you speak and uh, I, I really enjoyed what you had to say. So I was curious to bring you on and, and hopefully go a, a little bit deeper into that. Um, so yeah, maybe to start um, just giving the, the audience a little bit of a, of a background of, of who you are. I know there's always a big question, but <laughs> who you are, where you came from, what your life journey has been like and, and what led you to do the work you're, you're doing now. And maybe uh, if you can talk a little bit about the work you do. Sure. Oh, I was thinking about my life in terms of the shamanic topic. And uh, I think my first encounter with that was, thir I was 13 and I lived about two blocks from a college library in a college town. And I spent a lot of time there and I found Black Elk Speaks and I read that. And I thought, wow, you know, something resonated with me about that. But when I was, hmm, I can't even remember, about 30, um, I lived in an ashram for four months and had the, had the really great experience of having a guru come from India who was really quite an awakened guy. And I think I got Shaktipat then. And then I went... <clears throat> when I was in my 30s to Esalen and did a workshop with Stanislav Graf in um, <laughs> the name of the workshop was Understanding and Treating Spiritual Emergency. And I was very attracted to that because I had seen people come through my counseling center who really were not having a pathological experience, but they were having a transformative evolutionary experience. And there was no word for that. And I thought, oh, spiritual emergence, spiritual emergency. That makes sense. I want to know more about that. So I went from New Jersey to California and to Esalen and got in the hot tubs and learned about spiritual emergency. But what I didn't know was that I was going there to have one. <laughs> so I had one, which was the form of a kundalini awakening um, in the terms that I knew where the energy starts going and you have turbulence. I had a very turbulent life for about five years with all kinds of uh, prana moving and mudras. And, uh, and then I went and about four years later joined the first holotropic breathwork training, the Groff transpersonal training with Stanislav and Christina Groff. And my, my whole life changed in that. I got very involved with holotropic breathwork, which takes you into an extraordinary state of consciousness. And met my partner and just everything changed. I got very involved with the breathwork and did uh, psychedelics also. And I should say that the Kundalini awakening happened because of combination of doing the holotropic breath work and MDMA um, experience that, that I had there, not at Esalen, but on a beach near Esalen. And uh, things were just never the same after that. So, yeah, I don't know what else you want to know. I, I think because of the topic that you are talking about, plant medicines, I should say that I have done quite a few sessions of my own with plant medicines, but only three sessions in an, in an indigenous setting. So I'm very curious about your work and what you do and how it's different from the Western extraordinary states of consciousness that I have been so involved with. So how would you, how would you describe the work that you do now? Well, because of my work with holotropic breath work, 
I have developed a process which I now call um, inner ethics. And it's a way of looking at ethical behavior in a therapeutic setting um, in an internal way, like doing self-reflection and looking at our motivations. And I think it's really important right now because of the way psychedelics have, there's a burgeoning of interest in psychedelics. And I think that the indigenous cultures had thousands, hundreds, or maybe even thousands of years to develop a way to manage that process of going into and out of extraordinary states of consciousness. And Western people have not had that time to get it right. So we have a model right now for therapy, for therapeutic work, but it's a Western medical model. And how we bring in psychedelics to that Western medical model as they become legalized, which they look like they're on track to do, is going to be very important because every there's a lot of differences in psychedelic work from most Western medical work. So, I don't know. <laughs> That's what I want to do. And what I want to do is change the ethos of, of therapeutic work in Western settings to one that really pays a lot of attention to inner motivations, pays a lot of attention to care about the things that are different in psychedelic states, which includes how people get trained. So there's, there's a way in which Western medical people get trained and it doesn't include experiential work so and work on yourself so i think that's a big difference that we're going to have to somehow incorporate to do this right and i don't think we have much time to get it right You mentioned a, a beautiful book, which which I also read when I was young, and it had a, a deep impact too. Black Elk Speaks. Um, do you have a sense of why that why that really spoke to you, or why that touched you in a way? I recognized it. I recognized the power of extraordinary experience. His was a visionary dream in in. Uh, in a state caused by high fever, I think, as I recall. I mean, I haven't read it recently. But, and then the fact that he told other people in his community and they understood it as a visionary experience. That was something that was missing in my experience in our culture. But I recognized it as something that was important. Mm -hmm. What was your experience with Black Elk Speaks? I think it was at a, a time in my life where I was, uh, I really just had this kind of fervor of kind of devouring these, these spiritual or religious texts and, and, and really just seeing the commonality in it for me that I was seeing in all of them. And <laughs> I mean, I, I grew up in the U.S. and and I was a Boy Scout, I was an Eagle Scout, and I was always hiking and camping. And and a lot of Scouts is also, I think, in a beautiful way, like honoring a lot of the the, the North Native American traditions. And um, and uh, I think also for my father, uh, because he was very interested in uh, Native American culture and thought. Um, I mean, I remember even as a kid, like my favorite books were about Native Americans and just the, the way of life. And I mean, a lot was a bit stereotypical, but, you know, the, the teepee and the buffalo and, and kind of the plains. And um, so 
you know, and it's interesting because even now I, I do a lot of work with tobacco. And I remember as a kid, you know, learning that, that it was such a revered plant and, and yet being kind of perplexed because like my father smoked and I, I hated it. I couldn't stand it. It just seemed mm. toxic, bad in a way. And uh, I remember being in a car and the windows were rolled up and I felt like I couldn't breathe. <laughs> But there was something that I also knew that because all of these people had this reverence for this plant, that, that there, there was something to it. Um, so I think when I, when I read Black Elk, I think it was the first book by a Native American person where I, I really felt kind of the power of those teachings and, and, and like a very deep spiritual presence a, a very deep sense of truth um i think that's a word that's <laughs> kind of in this postmodern time we live in it, it's often uh not the the most pleasing word for people to hear but i think for me a lot of these spiritual traditions are pointing to a, a very deep truth a, a universal truth and and for me, there was something when I read that, it, it really hit. There was a very deep felt sense of this is truth. Like what he's pointing to is something universal, something beautiful. Um, and you were asking about maybe some of these like indigenous traditions. And um, I, I sometimes, I've said this a couple of times in my podcast, but a, a good friend of mine, he's a, his name is uh, Brian Best. Uh, he, he's an academic and he ended up moving to Peru and he, he, he spent a long time with Shipibo people uh, who do a lot of work with ayahuasca and, and he, he speaks Shipibo now. He's, he's done a dissertation and he's, he's kind of rewriting a Shipibo Spanish-English uh, dictionary, which is quite amazing. But I find etymology of words really interesting and um, one time when I first met him, he started telling me about the etymology of some of the words. And it was, I was just coming through a long process of dieting, uh, kind of this intensive plant work, but something he said really struck me and it, it's, it stood with me. And he was saying that the, the word for good day in Shipibo is, is hakun natu. And natu is translated as day, but on a deeper sense, it has this, this meaning of the world or the universe, uh, and in an even greater sense, this eternal present moment, which is the universe. And hakun is translated as good, but on a deeper level, it means that which, that which is life-giving, that which serves nature, which on a deeper level is that which is true, it's truth. So this idea of like, you know, good day, actually what's being said is like this ever eternal present moment is life giving. It's true. And um, <laughs> quite, quite beautiful way to, to greet people and quite, quite a paradigm shifting uh, <laughs> just the power of words. But, but yeah, I, I think that idea of truth and, and, and that, that black elk book uh, just very much resonated as something very true. And it, uh, I think it, it kind of sparked a, a deep curiosity to, to continue in these paths because I felt like so much was missing. Like there was all of this knowledge, but I didn't know how to access it. And I, I didn't know where to go to find it. And interestingly, moving to the, the jungle, the, the Peruvian Amazon, where there still are these, these quite old lineages of people who I think carry this wisdom was, was very revelational for me because I, I found for me, uh, people who still carried some of that that wisdom. So that's wonderful and very committed <laughs> to do that. And and I think I'm just reading a book by Stephen Cope right now about Dharma. Mm -hmm. About the concept, you know, the concept of Dharma is the, the what you're supposed to do, what's mine to do, basically, at at the moment and sometimes for a whole lifetime. And it's, it's really interesting when people lock onto that and do it full on and practice and become, get some mastery in that one thing by going deeply into it. And something happens where it's, more than just that one thing. It's, 
<clears throat> there's an understanding of spiritual concepts that are universal to other things. And it sounds like you took that kind of a path and are on it. I'm I'm really interested. You you said you spent time in Esalon, and and I think for people who maybe do this work, that's kind of a, this this mythical place in a way. And, and especially Stanislav Prof, as he's getting older, I think he's kind of taking on this this kind of mythical sage like uh, persona. But but he was really someone who uh, I think was really important in a way because he. I mean, even when I was growing up and, and I thought of psychedelics, uh, I was very resistant to them because it minded, it reminded me of, of kind of like hippies and just kind of losing consciousness in a way and, and kind of a, uh, I don't know, like a drug culture, but, but it wasn't, it wasn't maybe necessarily working towards a, a higher truth. And, and in many ways it was for sure. There, there was a lot of amazing change that came out of that, but it just, it seemed maybe more recreational than what I had perceived as something more spiritual, something uh, committed towards a deeper understanding of life. And Stanislav Graf seemed like a really interesting character because he was kind of like a straight laced guy in a way. Like he was a very oh, yeah. good looking man. He came from an academic background. He was very well-spoken. And, and so I think it changed a lot of people's perceptions, you know, versus someone like Timothy Leary, who had a very different persona. Like he was someone who I think really kind of commanded a, a respect and a power. And he was, he had this really beautiful way of expressing. Is that something you can talk about? Maybe your, your time in Esalon and, and your, your work and, and experience with, uh, with, with Stanislav Grof? Yes, I think he does have a lot of gravitas. And he, I, I used to call him the transpersonal ambassador. He speaks somewhere between six and nine languages. And he went all over the world talking about transpersonal psychology. He was one of the founders of transpersonal psychology with Maslow and somebody else I can't remember right now. Um, I think what he brought to the work was science and real science. Like a lot of scientists, I think, are kind of sliding into making their hypothesis come out well in the data. <laughs> and Stan looked at it really objectively and said, this is happening. What does this mean? How can I categorize it? <clears throat> He did thousands of LSD sessions and he not only supervised people doing them, but he did them himself and learned from that. And he said, you know, I have a quote here somewhere. He said, I just wrote an article for a therapist newsletter and had to use this quote. If professionals have not experienced deep letting go, their own fear, lack of personal knowledge, and insufficient faith in the process may communicate itself, preventing the client from going fully into the experience to complete it. And this can happen even if the professional does nothing overtly to interfere with the client's process. And then another quote from him is, because of the unique nature of the psychedelic state, it is impossible to reach a real understanding of its quality and dimensions unless one directly experiences it. So he practiced what he preached and he did, did that work. And then Timothy Leary came along who was you know, a prophet in his own right and uh, drugs became illegal psychedelics became illegal. And Stan and his wife, Christina, started the holotropic breathwork, which is a way to get into an extraordinary state, have all the same kinds of experiences, maybe with a different tone, um, as, as the psychedelics enable one to have. And 
that's what I did with him. When I went to Eslam, that's what I was going for, to learn learn from him didactically, but also to have the experience of holotropic breath work. And my first experience there was reaching for Shiva, which was my my icon or, or God from my work in the ashram. And hearing all this stuff in the room, lots of other people working and different sounds and cries and agony and, and ecstasy and all of it together. And because Stan, I'm, I'm getting around, <laughs> but because Stan was um, married to Christina, Christina introduced him to yoga, introduced him to Swami Muktananda. And he got in touch with a philosophy, which is real tantra of everything is one. All is one and all the parts are simultaneously different and separate and one. And so he understood that from his experiences of LSD, but he understood now that, so he, he also learned Sanskrit. That's one of the languages he knows. Wow. And um, so Christina gave him that whole concept to put that together from his scientific experience, his experiential experience of LSD. And, and then he, he got the spiritual concept from a culture that had thousands of years of investigating extraordinary states. So I, and, and the main thing that I got from that was to trust my inner healing intelligence and in holotropic breathwork, they call that the inner healer. And Stan taught that. Stan taught us a ritual or a ceremony in a Western tradition where people have a sitter and then there's a breather and there's a group of people that are having the experience of breathing. And we follow the process of the breather. We don't interfere with it. We don't try to interpret it. We don't pretend that we know what's going on. <clears throat> we act as sort of midwives to the process that's happening on the mat. And then in his ritual, there's one session, which is three or four hours, where, some, where the partners, there's one breather and one sitter, and then there's another session where the roles are reversed. So there's reciprocity and there's no therapizing. So there's not one person that is the expert. Stan, of course, was an expert, but um, what he tried to be an expert in at that time was being following the process. And that came from his scientific point of view. So let's see what what happens and it, it doesn't work to interfere with the process when people are getting into an extraordinary state, no matter how they get into it, the inner healing intelligence knows what it's doing and we need to let that happen. So that's the main thing that I learned from Stan over and that. And one other thing that was, is really important. And I think it's really important for anybody who's, going to be working with psychedelics is his cartography of the psyche. And if you have studied that, you probably have encountered that, that, he's, that he says that there are three major types of experience, categories of experience that can occur in any altered state. Extraordinary state is my preferred way of calling it, but everybody has a different way of calling it expanded state of consciousness. Non-ordinary state of consciousness was what Stan called it back then. <clears throat> and what, 
I forgot what I was going towards at that point. <laughs> Something about Stan, I don't remember. Do you think um, the, the holotropic breath work was, was that developed more as a response to the, the, the outlawing of LSD or was that something that he had already known about and, and was just very fascinated in regardless of the, 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 the legality of <clears throat> these at the time? No, it, he, it was because LSD <clears throat> and other drugs were illegal. And what, how he came to that was he noticed at the end of some LSD sessions when people had not completed the material that had arisen organically while the medicine was still in effect, that they would breathe more rapidly without a pause. And they would do that for a while and they would somehow get more energy and go back in to the extraordinary state of consciousness. And in that state, they could complete the material. So he thought, well, why not try that? And he also, again, had the benefit of Christina's yogic experience using different kinds of carnium to go into a extraordinary state in a way. And so they just did that and then it evolved one time they were having everybody breathe in a group lying down. And the story goes that Stan hurt his back. And so he couldn't help the people that needed some kind of help with body issues. And so they came up with everybody's going to partner up and there's going to be a sitter as well as a breather. And they're going to change roles because Stan hurt his back and it worked so well that they kept that element uh, in place. Mm. So they're in the, in holotropic breathwork, there's music and there's also something called focused energy release work, which is really about exaggerating tension in some way. And there's lots of ways to help people do that with their permission um, to complete material at the end of, set, of the session if it's not already complete. Are there any counterindications for, for holotropic breath work or as long as it's done in a, a safe setting, it's, it's pretty accessible to everyone? Um, there are, there's a medical form that people fill out before they do it. And uh, particularly any kind of cardiovascular history is not a good idea because you can get into a state where you're really physically active and there's deep emotion or PTSD that comes up and, or you can relive your birth. And there's a lot of, you can relive the experience of your mother giving birth, which is, as we know from either giving birth or watching people give birth in movies, there's a lot of pressure. And so if you have high blood pressure, if you have some kind of surgery for cardiovascular issues, you don't want to do it. And then retinal detachment is another issue. And, um, pregnancy is another issue. Although, you know, if people have a lot of experience in extraordinary states, and it really feels, I, I had one person in when we were doing breath work regularly who was eight months pregnant and she was absolutely sure her inner healing intelligence told her, I need to do this workshop. I said, well, I knew her well. And I, I said, okay, but if I tell you to stop, stop, you know, if she's going to get me. And what happened was that the baby who was not turned, turned in that session and got prepared to give birth a month later. And she also got the name of the baby during the session. So you never know. <laughs> you just sometimes have to make calls. I'm sure you've done that in your 
in your work, you have made calls that are exceptions to the rule. But generally, we, we try to be really careful in holotropic blessing. And is it known what's what's happening during holotropic breath work? Has it been studied, uh, like on a more scientific level, like mapping the brain and, and or the the body and what's being activated and what's changing? I think the Russians have done some of that, um, but I'm just not up on any of that stuff, and I don't particular. I I kind of have a theory that if if something works and you know how to work with it, uh, that's all I need to know. But I know other people need to know other things and I respect that too. I think it's nice to know and it's nice to have evidence-based um, data that you can point to to people that need to know that kind of stuff. So what are, what are some of the things that you, that you saw working uh, during that time at, at Esalon and in that work. Uh, I mean, obviously people's experiences are very individual, very different, but I would imagine you saw certain archetypes or kind of commonalities of things that were happening. Um, I mean, I would imagine for the vast yeah. majority for the good, which is why you continue to do that work. Um, yeah, Cause I'm sure a lot of people have heard of holotropic breath work, but I would imagine a, a lot of people haven't too. So mm -hmm. like, why would, why would one want to go into a room and, and kind of start doing this very deep, <laughs> you know, potentially uncomfortable kind of practice? Like what's, what's, what are the, the rewards that, that, that are hopefully awaiting people for that? I think that for the same reason that people journey to the Amazon, you know, they are called to know more about themselves and to be better people in a way. I, I want to know more about myself. I am called. I don't know when I'm called, usually why I am called, but I, I know that I am called. And some people who get that calling follow up and, and do it. Um, I think there's a lot in any of us that we don't know about ourselves. And that can be the, the, the three things that stand mapped, which is our biographical uh, experience, which can include really good things and really traumatic things that we have blocked out because for various reasons, usually because they're overwhelming in some way and we couldn't process them at the time so they need to come up later and then there's the perinatal category which Stan has done a lot of explaining about and that's really interesting because our birth experience according to Stan and in my experience I think it's true becomes a template or experiences later in life. So there are, there are four stages in the birth experience and those four stages pertain to any major change in your life. So if you know kind of what your birth experience was in those four stages of birth, you can go, oh, you know, that's happening now. And I know that there's a third stage and I know there's a fourth stage and I will get through this. And it's very, very helpful. I've used it in therapy a lot with clients. It's like, okay, this is this and this is that. So the idea is that when, when somebody is um, going to be born, first of all, BPM1 or the, or the first matrix as they're calling it now is before labor begins and everything is peaceful if it's a good womb experience and everything is taken care of the nutrition comes in and waste goes out and and you feel well contained and so forth and then labor begins and it's like a shock it's like okay say you got an eviction notice on your apartment and you go oh gosh what am I going to do 
I don't know what I'm going to do. And, and the world is ending, that kind of thing. So this is what Stan says, the fetus experiences. Like, okay, this womb has turned on me and there's no way out yet. And he compares that to Sartre and, the, and no exit kind of feelings. Like, this is never going to end. I'm always going to feel this way. And it's awful. It's, it's hell. And then the cervix does dilate and the fetus starts on its way down the birth canal. And that is analogous to, well, I'll start looking for apartments and I found a few that might work and I'm going to keep doing it. And the baby is struggling down the birth control, but also doing some of the struggling, doing, having some agency on the way out. It's not just being done to it. And then the final stage is birth, which is the end of the old being and the birth of the new being because the cord is cut and the baby is a separate being no longer connected to the mother. And so that happens like, okay, um, I've left the old apartment and I'm in the new apartment. I have a new life in the new apartment. And we all go through those phases many, many times in life of major, major change, divorce, all kinds of things. So it's really helpful to know that. And then the kinds of things, what happened to me in my birth was that my mother got ether right at the end when it wasn't needed. So I have this tendency of stopping right before I finish something and just kind of like going into a trance. Like if I was running a mile, I would stop like 10 steps before I got, got there. And so I notice this in my life and I make a choice. So knowing these kinds of things really helps us to make better choices and not be affected by all the unconscious stuff that has happened to us, including our birth. That was long. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> I, I drew that from all those years when I was doing the introductory talk of holotropic breathwork, which I haven't done for a while. Yeah. Do you have any sense of uh... I mean, because from what you're saying, it seems like that can be such an impactful thing on the, the development of, 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 of the human being. Do you have a sense based on that of, of like maybe best practices or, or better practices for, for how that experience can be done in a way that really potentially minimizes some of these more traumatic events that can happen? Like are you familiar with any like cultures that, that birth in a certain way that, that I don't know, like eases maybe that, that experience both for the mother and, and the, the baby that's coming out? I don't know too much about that, but I know that there are people doing that kind of thing much more than when I had my children. Um, You know, the, the birthing in water is one example in Western civilization that's being done. I remember, I remember when I was having my first daughter, what I wanted to do was get out of the bed and lean over a hole with, with my elbows on the bed. And that was the posture that really felt right. Get back in bed. We can't have you, you know, they were afraid the baby would drop on the floor. Or something. But it was, mm. You know, I think, I think we know a lot more now with midwives and so forth in the Western culture. Do you know any um, cultural experiences of birth that are, are better and probably don't end up with trauma? It's, it's, it's not something I've, I've done a lot of, uh, I guess, research into. Um, I mean, I think interestingly in my work, uh, I mean, there are people who specialize in, in more, I guess you could call them women's issues, uh, 
things with their 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 moons, their cycles, with certain female diseases, ovarian cancer, things like that, and also birthing. Um, from from the little I do know, and it's it's something that that I am becoming more interested in, just as I begin to understand, you know, the, the human experience more and, and being presented with more cases, more diverse cases. But um, I mean, I, I know all throughout the Amazon, all throughout the Americas, there, there were uh, like very elaborate rituals. Um, one of the processes that, that, you know, often working with plants, um, a common theme that one would hear is that, you know, plants are medicine, but the plant itself has its limits also. Uh, like a, a traditional doctor would never just give the plant and then say, okay, you know, bye, like that's it. Almost always it was seen that this process surrounding the medicine was very important. And, and often in the Amazon, it's called doing a dieta. So making certain lifestyle changes, cutting out certain things. And I mean, it's kind of similar, I think in a certain way of going to an allopathic doctor and they, they give you a medicine and they say, you know, these are the things that are counterindicated, maybe don't take this and this and this, but I think there's not so much of that culture. And they would say that the dieta is vital for the medicine to be able to work. So kind of this idea of, of in a way like the, the set in the setting and uh, yeah. to allow that to really happen. Um, and so I know for the birthing process, there was often these very like elaborate rites where the mother would have to not eat certain foods because it was seen that this food could have an impact on the baby. It may also depend whether the baby was a, a male or a female and um, and then a lot of often like massage uh, by usually a woman who was very specialized in that field, knowing like where in the body she may be holding tension, massaging that, beginning to, to open, maybe moving the, the baby, um, using all sorts of plants to, to aid in that uh, process, not only ingesting, but topically. Um, and then, yeah, it seems like also very often birthing in water was a, a really common practice. Um, and then even in, in the following, there was, there was tremendous kind of care given in those first days, weeks, months, again, uh, you know, certain practices that you should do that you shouldn't do. Um, and, and even, I think even once the child was, you know, a number of years old and maybe not breastfeeding anymore, even after that, like the mother was, there were still certain times where, you know, only eat these foods for this time, maybe when your moon comes. I mean, it's a lot. So I, I don't know all about it, but I do know it was, it was seen as something that was, uh, there was a lot of knowledge there. And, and one of, one of the guys I've studied with, he's, he's comes from the Colombian Amazon and in, in his uh, culture, the, the Tubu people, you know, like even, even when the young woman had her first period or when the young boy had his first nocturnal dream, then there was like other prescriptions and certain foods you couldn't eat. And, and they would actually say like, if these weren't honored, then that could lead eventually down the road to a certain disease. And so they would actually view the root of a lot of disease as not following these kind of ancient customs, which I found fascinating because it's something that most of us, we just don't really think about. Right. And yet, you know, in all of these cultures, they are pointing towards this, this idea that, that medicine is super important, but there's all of these other things that surround it as well. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Mm. You know, what comes to my mind is what, what effect is of this is on intention because of remembering to eat the right things and focusing on health. And do you have any sense of how much is intention and how much is plant? from your work. I know the plants have entities and you have relationship with that. I know that I'm talking about, you know what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. 
I think it's huge. I think it's huge. Um, I mean, really, my my main teacher would often say, you know, a, a really a really properly blessed cup of water can cure. You know, if that intention is truly there, uh, the intention of the person giving it and the receptivity of the person receiving it that that it can heal. And uh, I mean, I think even in our Western traditions, we have this knowledge too. We we've forgotten about it. I mean, I, I remember. You know, one of the things Jesus said was it's, it's not the, it, it's not what, what comes into your mouth that's important. It's what comes out of your mouth, you know, and, and this idea that, that that intention, those words, that, that, that aligning to something is, is, is vital. And so I think ultimately it's a mix, you know, I mean, obviously many of these plants are very powerful. Um, and maybe even if you don't have a lot of belief, <laughs> these plants can kind of shake you out of that. Uh, but yeah, certainly, I, th I think like you're saying, uh, that there's probably a lot to that. And I mean, even just the act of any ritual, I mean, yeah. you know, maybe there's no, maybe there's no physical benefit to it. Uh, you know, also like what comes to mind is even something like smoking. You see tobacco again being used in, in all of these cultures all throughout the Americas and often with very similar um, ideas because smoking was actually the least commonly way of working with tobacco. It, traditionally, not that many people actually smoked. It was more ingesting, eating it, making a paste. Um, but the smoking the people who did there was kind of these common archetypes i mean even even in the us this idea of like prayer uh, before the, the peace pipe before when there was a meeting before any words were spoken we we ingested the tobacco because it was seen that our words would be pure they they would come from a place of strength they, mm -hmm. the words wouldn't uh, hit people they they would hopefully be soft but you know powerful but soft words um but you know, very much uh, more south is this idea of, of of the smoke could be cleansing, it could be purifying, protecting, and I think a lot of that is intention. I, I mean, you know, if someone is a doctor, they're doing this work. However, you want to think about it, um, you know, energies can come to us, people's traumas. I mean, I'm sure as you know, you know, working with people. We can, we can be very open. We can take on things. And uh, so I think even just having that ritual of like, you know, I'm, I'm cleaning myself with the tobacco. I'm, I'm blowing it over me. That there's something, even just taking a second to like, to create space, to create a boundary, to, to, to name that, okay, I'm, I'm letting this go. That, you know, this interaction or this, this work is now done and I'm protecting myself. And, there's something very powerful in that, you know, it's, it's, it's taking time to set that intention and to, to kind of break those bonds. And, and then there's the literal fact that, <laughs> you know, tobacco is used as, as a, as a pesticide, as an herbicide, like it has very strong um, anti-parasitical properties, antiviral. So um, mm -hmm. if we think about disease in terms of, you know, something is put, but someone has breathed on me or, you know, well, that would on a physical sense potentially be protecting you as well. So. Wow. That's really interesting. I had one experience with a Brazilian shaman that came up and, and did a ceremony in a, it was a Tibetan place that's right near us in Santa Cruz. And he had a big like cigar and he would blow it he would take it in and blow it on people and go around and there were about I don't know 40 people in the room and they were dancing and he would blow it on and I had an ecstatic experience with that it was very powerful mm -hmm. tobacco is very strong I mean, a lot of the, most of the tobacco that, that's grown is, is blonde tobacco. Um, and it's, it's much less strong than the, what they think is probably the, the more original, which is the black tobacco or the, 
the Rustica, it's called. Um, and it's very strong. I, I mean, I remember when I, when I first came to the jungle, working a lot with ayahuasca is uh, a lot of the, the people I was working with were a group called the Shipibo. And, um, and very much in their tradition is, is smoking this pipe when they're in ceremony. And even outside of ceremony, they would, they would smoke. And it, it's a very common motif you hear that the, the tobacco is like the food of the gods. It, it feeds the plant spirit. So even outside of ceremony, they're often smoking their pipe to kind of feed that internal energy, the, the, the plants that they've worked with. And uh, I remember at the time, it seemed like a big pipe. I, I mean, now <laughs> I, I've kind of grown, so it, it's not as big of a pipe. But I remember in the beginning, it seemed like a very big pipe. And I filled it up and, and I was sitting in my, my tambo, which is like my little hut. And, uh, and I, I'd smoked a bit like the, 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 the cigarillos, like the cigarettes, I guess you would call them. Um, and they were fine. I, it didn't really seem like much, but I remember the first time I smoked that pipe and I was also swallowing the smoke because that was what I was taught and blowing it on myself. And before I could finish the pipe, everything started spinning. I got super nauseous. I started sweating. My heart started racing and all I could do was stagger over to my bed and I just passed out and I went into like a, a full blown experience and it was, wow. it was very intense. And, um, that's just from, <laughs> yes, just from it smoking. sounds like very powerful medicine. Yeah. So I see behind you that that looks like, a, is that Shiva behind you? <laughs> Shiva and then a Shiva stone yeah. underneath it. Yes, yeah, Shiva is, is what I relate to in terms of the universe and the ecstatic experience of destruction, creation, mm. death, rebirth. Yeah, I find that a fascinating aspect of Shiva. And, and it, I think it's one of these things that often people don't like to talk about is, is death. And, and it's such a, I think for anyone who works with plants or psychedelics, it's such a common motif is, is death. Yes. And, and for me, that it's very fascinating that you're interested in Shiva because it, I think in many of these new age kind of traditions, it's there's this idea about love and light and birth and feminine and and Shiva seems <laughs> almost in a way like the counter to that. It's the it's God, but it's also in a way this like idea of, of death, of destruction, which gives way to to life and, and to rebirth. But that's such like a a, a powerful motif and it, yeah, and people have that aversion to change, you know, I think. And that's what death is. I remember I, I lived in a big house with a lot of people at one place that burned down. And the next day, it was like a shot. Everything was gone. But I was strangely ecstatic I was okay everything is gone what happens now what will be created what do we do and it's it, that is an ecstatic experience for me when things change and I Hope death will be. <laughs> you mentioned uh, that, that many people who were coming to Esalon, um, I, I think the, the term you used was um, like a spiritual emergence uh, that they were, they were experiencing. Um, yeah. And then you also... Yeah, Oh, sorry, you also mentioned um, like your own process with this this Kundalini awakening. Is is that something you can talk more about? What whether it's your own or or what you saw in other people? Like what what you experienced was was happening? Yes. Well, I think there's different kinds of spiritual emergence and and emergency. 
emergency is when you can't function and you basically need somebody to help you for a while. Emergence happens and you still function, but it's pretty turbulent. And there's shamanic um, spiritual emergency. Stan and Christina wrote a book called, what was it? <laughs> It'll come, Stormy Search for the Self, it's called. And Christina talks about her own Kundalini experience in it. And they also talk about the different forms that spiritual emergence can take. I have a theory about that that I haven't, I've just written a little thing about it. But I think spiritual emergence comes through the fourth function. Do you know the functions in the Jungian? Mm -hmm. There are four functions and one is thinking and one is feeling and one is intuition and one is sensation. Mm -hmm. And usually you have mastery in a first function. That's the one that is easy for you and you it's well defended because it's easy for you and you've learned a lot about it. And the fourth function is, the, is called the inferior function in, in Jungian work. And that's the opposite of the paired function. So for example, thinking and feeling is paired and intuition and sensation is paired. And if my first function is intuition, which mine is, my fourth function is sensation. And I think the Kundalini experience is very physical and it's all about sensation and it's all about clearing the blocks where the channels, the meridians, um, so that everything is connected and united and you have more ability to work in all the functions, especially the inferior function. But while this is happening in a spiritual emergency, what happened to me anyway is that my first function kind of shut down. For instance, I'm a really organized person. I have plans and I have, I couldn't get to that, you know, and I would just have to trust that I would know what to do when it was time to do it. And, uh, and I had a lot of mudras and I, what I had to do was to set a time every day to spend up to an hour in my meditation room and just surrender to whatever happened with my body. And what happened with my body usually was mudras and postures and sometimes very strange things like bumping my heart or one time my head went around and around and around and I had to let, I had to really surrender and let go or bad things would have happened to my neck. <laughs> And sometimes I would fall over and, and all that was somewhat scary, but because I had been to the ashram, I knew about this kind of thing. And I, I had some kind of strange trust in it all. And so that's what happened. And then a lot of turbulence in relationships and a lot of, strange experimental things happened and I just I just went with it I went with whatever the inner healing intelligence intuitively told me to do I I did and I, I didn't have I had I didn't have much support in those days there wasn't much support either in writing or in person so just trusting. What and I had dance work and I had the ashram, the, that kind of teaching to sustain me. You mentioned this idea of, of um, like emergency versus uh, emergence. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think is that balance? Because it, it, it seems like something that, I mean, there's kind of a joke where in 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 the West, if you say, like, I've lost my mind, they, they send you to a, a mental institution. 
in, in the East, like in India, if you say, I've lost my mind, everyone bows down to you and say, oh, you know, <laughs> guru, how, how do I achieve that? Um, what do you think is that, that kind of balance between people who really may be in a bad place and are like not able to function and, and actually need help versus someone going into kind of this dark night of the soul where they're just, they're going to a very deep, dark place because on the other side of that, there's, there's, there is an emergence. Mm -hmm. In one sense, you don't know until you have the result. And it's hard to differentiate. But there are a couple of clues, and Stan and Christina go into that in, in the stormy search for the self. And one clue is whether they can, you know, periodically come up for air and talk about their process and what it's doing. Is there some kind of continuity of progress in, in self-understanding that's happening? Um, and is it part of a long spiritual practice? You know, usually you have some kind of spiritual practice and then it happens and you lose functionality for a time. You know, I, I, I can think of two ex examples of that. One is the guru that came to my ashram when I was there was Swami Kripalanandaji. And he had a period where he lost his mind and threw himself into the river, a turbulent river one night, and his disciples all rushed down the coast of the river and picked him up. And during the time he was being propelled down the river, it was very metaphorical for him, and he surrendered to the water and let it carry him and they retrieved him out of the water. So I think when we're talking about ethics and healing people that are working in the healing professions, their job is to protect the person physically, emotionally from their inner critic or whatever that's telling them they're crazy or whatever. And, and really protect them physically because people can get strange ideas in that, you know, they, they don't really have a foot in the material universe. They have a foot in the, they have both feet in the place where time and space is not the same as it is in this world uh, in normal consciousness. So they can think that they need to, jump off a cliff and fly and and they actually if they did that they would crash so it, it is a big responsibility when you're administering some kind of medicine or method that brings you into that kind of state um, to take that responsibility. And we did that in holotropic breath work too. We had a sitter and we had facilitators. And <clears throat> if people weren't finished at the end of the session, we'd work with them anyway. You know, there was a commitment. It wasn't a, okay, your hour's done and it's, it's time to go. Oh, time's up. <laughs> no. And I'm sure that you have the same thing when you're working with people with the dieta. Um, you have a, you, you are committed to care. Yeah. So your your work with um, inner ethics. How did that How did that start? What What led you to to see that that was something that was not only important but also that you you found passion with. Well, I was, I was in, I was doing holotropic breath work and I was a trainer in the Groff transpersonal training and working with Stan Groff and Tab Sparks. And there were just a few people who were therapists who got into ethical trouble. And I just, 
I just was very puzzled by it because these were people that had never gotten into ethical trouble and they were fine people and they cared about their clients. And yet they made mistakes usually in the in sexual uh, mistakes and got involved with the client. And, you know, they had bad things happen in their lives because of it. And I thought, well, it must be about the extraordinary state of consciousness. And at the same time, I was taking a course in my master's degree program in traditional ethics. So I was able to have this dual perspective of this is what's happening here and this is the traditional ethics. And I realized that there were a couple of things missing in the traditional ethics because that really needed to be there when you were working in extraordinary states. And what I came to the, the conclusion was that there were more, you need to pay more attention to the basic traditional ethics issues of safety and vulnerability and all of that. <clears throat> and there are different ethical issues that are involved in extraordinary states including training that we talked about and the needs for special training. We talked about that quite a bit in the clubhouse. So that's what happened. And I got, and then I, I was working with Jack. I was assisting at Jack Cornfields and Stan Groff's special retreats where they combined Vipassana meditation and Volatopic breath work. And we were, and Jack would have a supervisory meeting with the assistants after the retreat was over. And we had an ethical issue that people were talking about, which I forget what it was. And I talked about some of these ideas that I was having. And he looked at me and then he grabbed my journal and he wrote ethics in great big letters in my journal. And it was kind of permission for me. It was kind of validation. Nobody was interested in what I was talking about, about ethics at that point. This was the first teacher I had that said, this is important. And it's so important for teachers to say that if they feel that to people, because it really made a difference to me. So in six months, I wrote the first ethics book, and this was back in 1995. And I wrote the first version of The Ethics of Caring, and then now I published in 2017 The Ethics of Caring Revised, and it won an award, and a lot of people really like it, and I use it as a text and when I'm teaching psychedelic therapists in her ethics. So that's how I got started, and that's where I am, and I'm thinking not only about teaching people to use inner ethics, but also to teach people to teach in their ethics, because I think there's going to be a lot of need for, for this with, as we talked about the Western model, trying to absorb a different way of working with psychedelics. So can you, I, I mean, I, I know it's a big subject, but are, are there some things you can say about just kind of the nature of ethics and, and what you've seen or, or maybe best practices in that field, things that, that you've you found through your own work to be really conducive, kind of pillars that that can maybe be followed that, that would help to, to shift that in a better direction? I think the the main things that are not covered in traditional ethics education. Eth traditional ethics education is laws and codes and standards external things that tell you what to do, tell you what to do with your behaviors. <clears throat> and inner ethics is about looking within ourselves and doing self-reflection and discovering what our motivations are. And we do that in two ways. We do it with self-reflection, really paying attention to what's going on with us and how that might be in conflict with the client's best interests. And the other way we do it is supervision or peer supervision. 
And I teach peer supervision and in, inner ethics because I think it's really important. Um, it's a way that professionals can get together and they pay with their time and they do reciprocal roles, facilitating and being a consultant and so forth <clears throat> with each other because there are things that we know about ourselves and there's things that other people know about us that we don't know. And there are things that we don't know and they don't know. And so the other thing that we have to do is our own deep work. So those things can emerge and we can work with them and make choices based on self-awareness <clears throat> rather than just impulsively acting because motivations create actions. And if we don't know our motivations, we are acting without choice. So where, I think before we started, we were, we were saying about how this work is really beginning to, to, to take off in a way and to expand. Where, where do you see this work going? Um, I mean, because even like you were mentioning with, with Stanislav Grof, with LSD, that there was a period maybe in the 50s or the 60s where it was being used a lot. And I think maybe a lot of people aren't familiar with that. It was being used a lot in therapeutic uh, settings. It was almost considered kind of revelational by, by psychiatrists, by psychotherapists, because it really allowed them to do their work better. Um, and then, you know, maybe in the, I can't remember exactly, but the early 70s or something, it started to become criminalized and, and all of the research was cut. And, and now it seems like there's, there's very much a, a reemergence. Uh, you know, interestingly, I think a lot of that is actually coming from a lot of this indigenous knowledge becoming more out in the open and, and people becoming more interested in it and then emergence through things like mushrooms and um, MDMA. So where do you, where do you think this is moving? Because obviously, you know, you brought up a really good point in that like there are kind of different systems. It's uh, we're, we're not working, at least in the US, like we're not working in a purely indigenous system. It, it's something that's, that's, that's new, that's changing, that's maybe drawing on these, but uh, like obviously things can only be worked with in the way in, in the culture in which they, they, they're, they're emerging from. So uh, do you have any sense of like how this, this work is, is going to move and begin to, to, to shape itself? I think what we need, and that's why I'm doing what I'm doing, is an ethos of self-reflection and self-knowledge for people that are doing this work. And if we can get that in place, I think all will be well. It's not that we won't make mistakes. You know, I wrote my book on all the mistakes that I thought about making myself or did make or saw other people making. But, but the question is, can we learn from that? Can we become aware? And can we prevent mistakes by knowing the mistakes that other people made? Reading the book or ans asking ourselves the questions that are in the book about our motivations. And if we can do that, it's already a sacred, it's much more sacred atmosphere than saying, I know best, I'll give you this medicine, go home and spray something up your nose or whatever, whatever they're doing these days with some of the stuff. And because it's, a it's all relationship. And I try to teach right relationship. And I love the metaphor of right relationship as a dance in which you're really following and leading and and really aware because otherwise you'll step on toes or bang into the wall or bang into somebody else. And so it's a lot of paying attention is what I think we need. So where's it going? I don't know. I don't know how this will 
end up. I think if we don't pay attention, people are going to say it's too dangerous. You know, it's it's got to be illegal again. I think that could easily happen. And the and the other. You know, We're, it makes us more conscious and we're conscious spiritually as well. We're conscious of all the connection. And what I, what I call spiritual is really understanding our connections to everything, our connections to each other, our connections to all things in this universe and our responsibility for that connection. And I think that'll happen with the psychedelic experience. So that may bring us to critical mass in working well with this medicine. I think also educating the people that will be taking the medicines, like for example, Shakruna put out an ayahuasca guide for people that were traveling to South America and maybe getting involved with shamans and how to, you know, be aware and protect themselves, especially from sexual abuse. But I think that kind of education about what do people, what should people expect from somebody who is giving them psychedelics? And what, what's wrong? What's not right relationship? So they, so they know, so they have some perspective and they don't, as people tend to do, sometimes they think I'm wrong because this happened. And so to know what, what is expected and what the qualification should be would be helpful because we'll get more to critical mass if we don't just focus on the professionals because there's much more population and the consumers and the clients. So I think that's an interesting way to go to. What do you feel in regards, because um, I mean, I think ethics are, are, are super important and I, I like how you're saying it is, is also it's this inner, like we have to do the inner work and also use this word dance and I think that's really important because it seems like so many of these things are a dance and, and it is personal to some degree, but kind of that difference between something that's universal versus something that is personal. Like an example being, I think one could make the argument really well that a doctor and a patient uh, shouldn't have a relationship. I think there's, there's many examples of where that's gone wrong. There's ethical questions about the power dynamic, about, you know, a lot of things. I think one could easily make that argument. And I've seen it myself, like often it ends up turning out quite badly. Um, and yet also I've seen instances where beautiful things have happened from that, uh, where, where there has been a, a deep connection and um, even like, centers have been born out of that. Um, so, you know, it seems like, you know, even like you mentioned with Chakruna, like, I think that's, that's super beneficial, like to prepare people, like what to expect, what are good things to look for. The thing that also comes to mind though, the, the downside of that is if you have one group or a centralized body saying like, this is the way that it should be, then it's potentially, you know, cutting out other ways that, that for some people may be beneficial, but not for all people. Yes. Um, I too have seen ways in which it's worked for people. Um, but they're really the I think the exception, there's a lot of people who were sexually abused in childhood who can put out sexuality 
because that's how they learn to get attention and care. And if they didn't do that, they didn't get attention and care. And so it's hard to know if you're on the other end of that, whether that's the case or whether there's something more happening. And because of transference and counter-transference projection, um, we don't always know what each other is thinking or doing. And, and we don't always know what we are. It gets back to our motivations and unconscious motivations and whether it's in the client's best interest or it isn't. So I think one of the safeguards to that is having supervision and peer supervision and also having a community, community ceremonies are really important because, you know, in the, this is one of the ways I think that indigenous people have safeguarded against that kind of thing that everybody knows what everybody's doing in a village and everybody watches in a ceremony what's happening and everybody knows the shaman's results in a ceremony. Now, when the people are coming in from far, you know, they're foreigners and they're coming in to a village, there's not the same kind of care and relationship and um, idea about women foreigners or, or other people that there might be to fellow villagers. So there's that kind of thing. It's, it's fraught with a lot of problems to have a personal relationship. I, you know, when I was attracted to somebody as a, uh, a client, I got supervision and it's very normal and common for people to be attracted to clients. And I said, I just want to get rid of this. <laughs> I want to know what's going on so that I can get back to being a, a therapist. And the person said to me something that I always will remember. She said, that person shows you as a therapist. That's what they want. And immediately everything balloon burst and I was back to reality and, and knew my job. And the other thing is that people can come back over time. People come back to me 10 years later and they have something else going on in their life and they know that I'm a safe person. I'm not. Meanwhile, I haven't become a close friend or a, a sexual partner. And, and, and so they can use me again as a therapist. And I feel like that the therapist role is a commitment. It's almost like deciding to have a child. You know, it's like, it's a, it's a lifetime commitment. You are joined in some way for the benefit of that person. And there's, of course, there's reciprocal benefit too, but not in a way that, that exploits that person. that makes sense to you yeah. yeah yeah and a lot of these things they they also seem like a very fine line and and again i, I really like that that phrase dance um we're we were recently working with someone and uh, i won't say her name but she's she's a therapist and uh you know she was kind of realizing through this process about these boundaries that she needed to have because she found herself becoming too involved with her clients, not in a romantic way, but just like as a yeah. friend mm -hmm. and, and kind of finding that relationship expanding outside of just the, the therapy session. Um, and, and I think that's something uh, probably a lot of people who do this work kind of struggle or, or have to juggle that, find that dance is, is there anything through through your work where you've seen uh, something along those ethics of like where that where those boundaries you know lie and because I think a lot of times from the therapist's point of view 
there's this need to help or this, you know, this genuine desire to help. Like I want to help this person. And so when someone asks for something, if there's that natural therapist desire comes out, well, you know, let me help that person. But, you know, I think sometimes maybe we don't realize that, that at a certain point, that's maybe not helping them like, like a, mm -hmm. a gentle, but also a clear no while it may seem a bit abrasive in the long term can actually be more beneficial to that person. In my teaching, I use a lot of vignettes of things that have happened and people discuss them in groups. And I think that's where they kind of get more insight into their own motivations of what would they do in that situation and what what are the issues involved and they can see it more clearly because it's not what's happening to them. And they can hear other points of view and other perspectives because as you say, as I said, it's, it's a dance and, and things are different with different people. The other thing what you said brings up is um, the rescue triangle, the drama, Cartman drama triangle. Like if you really get hooked into being a rescuer into helping, then you're on this rescue triangle and you're going to be in one of the two other roles, it's inevitable. And one of them is perpetrator and one of them is victim. So, and, and so it, once you have been in that drama triangle for a while or, and have the consequences of being in the other, roles you may love to be a rescuer but hate to be a victim and really hate to be a perpetrator <laughs> so um you try not to get hooked into being a rescuer but let people do what they can do for themselves or find other resources if they can that's empowering to the person and instead of doing it for them Something else you mentioned, which I, I think is is really important, is this idea of training. That as this work begins to expand, not only having like the more learned or read training, but that experiential training. Um, do you have any idea of, or you see a way of like how how that would actually work? Like, uh, because one thing you said I think is really important, and I think that is a beautiful safeguard in a way is doing these things more communally um, because there are, there's just, there's a, there's a natural checks and balance. There's other people to, 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 to share, to speak. And especially if that, if that environment is, is, is encouraged, if that's, you know, it, it's conducive to that, it's encouraged to speak and to share in that way. I think that can be really beneficial. Um, but do you have a sense of, of how that training can happen because again, I think it's super important, but again, the, the thing that comes to mind is kind of like the last idea of if it is a centralized body, then the training may fall under a very specific umbrella that may exclude other ways that, that could potentially be beneficial as well. You mean uh, like, the Western medical model of training? What, what do you mean? Yeah, exactly? I guess the idea that comes to mind, um, I know uh, like uh, MAPS, the, you know, the Multidisciplinary mm -hmm. Association of Psychedelic Studies, I think it's called. Uh, they've they've uh, just completed, I believe very successfully, um, a trial with MDMA and, uh, yes. and PTSD. And, and I think it was something like, two out of three, 66% of the people were actually yes. PTSD free, which is incredible. I mean, that's, that's amazing. It's, there's nothing like that for P PTSD. Mm -hmm. They're in phase three studies now right. because they fast, fast tracked it because it was so successful. Mm -hmm. So it's got to be legalized in 2023. Maybe. Yeah. And it, I think one of the things that they're requiring is I think one of the people has to be um, a psychologist or a psychiatrist, uh, someone who's, who's trained in that. And then the helper doesn't necessarily need to be. Mm -hmm. um, 
which again seems like a, a really good thing, like to have someone who does have that knowledge there. Uh, you know, but also I'm thinking, like for example, and this still may be a, a long way off, but uh, you know, imagine two uh, people coming from the Amazon who are who are doctors in their own right, but they legally then wouldn't be able to do that work because they're they don't hold a degree as a as a psychologist um and yet you know like for example many of my colleagues who i work with they often joke that they're they're shipibo but they would joke that they're uh like shippy psicologos like they're <laughs> they're shipibo psychologists that essentially uh -huh. that's what their work is is they're they're going yeah. into the mind of these people and trying to reorder and um mm -hmm. And and maybe that's just that is what it is. It's we're we're working in a certain model, and and those are the guidelines that will be, kind of taken as that's what needs to happen in order for these things to happen. And and maybe in that group setting, that's what it is. There there is a psychologist, and then there can be other people who who work together to to create that space. I think it's good that there are at least two people involved in it because. MDMA opens up the heart, all kinds of things can happen with transference and counter-transference. <clears throat> so I don't, I don't know how it's gonna happen. And I, I just don't know. <laughs> I think it would be good if it was um, at least two people and that if they, that the training includes extraordinary states of consciousness as well as didactic training and also goes into helping people look at their own trigger management. Renee Harvey has written a chapter in a wonderful book that's coming out in September called Psychedelics and Psychotherapy, which is a, um, a volume of really great people writing different chapters on different things and and she says that it should include self-management training, debriefing, formal supervision, follow-up on any material that's arising and, and really paying attention to the relational aspects like transference and counter-transference. And the other thing that I think is important is there's two things. One is knowing what we talked about earlier about Stan Groff's territory, the cartography of the psyche and the kinds of experiences that can happen in any psychedelic experience. And also um, the territory of the medicine itself. I think it's really important to have personal experience. Like I read that quote from Stan, the personal experience of the medicine that you're working with as he, you know, took LSD and took high dose of LSD and went into other worlds and so forth, he practiced what he preached about that. Um, and for example, like, you know, the, all these training programs and, and treatment programs are springing up all over with like ketamine clinics and, and one ketamine clinic just took my name off the map site and put it on their site as a potential integration therapist. And I just had to contact them and say, take this off. I've never taken ketamine and I don't know it. And I wouldn't be able to understand. Maybe I would, but I might not because I've never taken it. So I don't even want to to do that, I just want to be upfront, say I've never taken it, and I, I don't know what you experienced in terms of the medicine itself. And I think that's really important. And I know some training programs right now, because there's no legalization, are using holotropic breathwork. And I think that's fine for a training program, but when it becomes legal, when you can prescribe it, you should take it. Also, before prescribing. Yeah. 
I mean, because I think also with maps, they they're they give people the opportunity to take it, and I think they encourage it, but it's not a requisite. Um, and it's interesting because um, I mean, even in the work I do, I mean, you know, there would it's very much like you said. There, there's first there has to be that that desire to want to do it. To, to be willing yeah. to do it. And then it's usually a very long and, and kind of grueling process of, of, of personal work. It can be years, you know, a decade before someone even then kind of begins sitting in ceremony and kind of assisting and just kind of being the helper and slowly starting to do that work. And it can be a very long process before they're they're kind of given that that authority or that that title of, of someone who can do that work. And it seems like with this work, I mean, we are so open and so sensitive and, you know, again, that the power of words and as you said, the power of intention, motivation, you know, even <laughs> something I've had to learn to be very careful with, you know, is, is one word can completely shift someone's experience. And if that's not something that's really from a from a place not only of working on the self, but working with other people and, and really understanding that power, it, it you know, there, there can definitely be consequences for that. Yes. But one of the things I talk about in, in my inner ethics training is the power differential between, you know, because it's there, whether we want it or not, whether we have ideals about equality and reciprocity and all, but it's often there. And it's what the client or the person who's, what do you call the person? The client or the subject in the research or the, the person who's taking the medicine under your care, what do you call that person? <laughs> there can be different names. Um, <laughs> it could be client. In, in Spanish, we, we often use the word pasajero, which is like a, a passenger, a guest, uh, someone who's ah, coming nice. for a particular time. Um, yeah. I'm going to write that down. <laughs> I think words are really important. And I'm studying brain spotting now because I think it's really good for... PTSD and other things, and also expansion work, because the focus of where you look connects to a spot in your brain and your body. And if you hold that spot in with somebody who has it intention and attention on you, um, amazing things happen. <clears throat> but they have a, a, an acronym, W-A-I-T, wait, why am I talking? So not interfering with the process by using words. And they also teach something that I'm finding new for me to learn and, and very valuable is to use their words if they are talking and you are feeding back, but, and not, I always used to think it was, it was more bonding to come up with my own paraphrase of what they were saying. Uh, it's like their words, their core words about their experience. And to have that come back to them is really important mirroring and validation. Mm -hmm. You probably know this already, but I just learned it because I was trained in a university about therapy. <laughs> Do you think in, in terms of ethics that, that it's important to differentiate um, in terms of, of gender and in terms of like a man and a woman? Um, like I was just, I was thinking the other day, there was a South Park episode and um, I, I can't remember the characters' names, but the, the older brother takes his younger brother to the police, I, I think, and he says, or, no, no, he goes to the police and he says, um, you know, there, there's a child that's being abused by his teacher and all the police get their guns out and they're like, okay, like, let's go get this abuser. This is terrible. We have to stop this. And, uh, and, and they say to, to the, the young boy, like, what, what's the name of your sister? And he says, no, no, it's, it's not my sister. It's my younger brother. 
mm-hmm. and they, they kind of look at him and they go, well, well, who's the teacher? And he says like, uh, you know, Miss Smith. <laughs> and they're like, Miss Smith, like the, the, the really beautiful Miss Smith. And he's like, yeah, yeah, that's the one. <laughs> and they're all just kind of like, wow. <laughs> and it's also something I've noticed in my work. Um, you know, there, there are uh, very much as you were mentioning, uh, you know, it's a very sensitive state and, and it kind of crossing those sexual boundaries can be, it can be very traumatic for people. And, and I think that's why, as you were saying, like often traditionally these were done in a group setting. Uh, I mean, I think most, uh, I've heard many women say this, uh, that, uh, you know, even indigenous women, that they would never go to, to a male shaman by themselves. They would always, uh, yes. bring yeah. bring a friend or a relative um, I think that's also kind of in a sense a, a just a bigger custom as well in the sense that you would never kind of show up to a place alone like you would always come with family because your family in a sense is like it's like well this is who you are this is these are my people this is my lineage mm-hmm. like and it's also not necessarily seen like a lot of ailments aren't necessarily seen as a purely individual ailment there there's that a collective healthcare. ailment mm-hmm. um, so it's really important to come with your family because that the healing process may involve them as well um but you know there there have been many cases of 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 that I think are becoming more well known of, of male shamans, male corderos crossing those boundaries. And again, that can be very complicated as well because what those boundaries are may be, you know, they're they're different depending on 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 who that person is and um, you know what's seen as appropriate, what's not seen as appropriate. I, I mean, I think many people would probably agree. Yes, like having sex with your client is not acceptable, but is touching their head acceptable? Is touching their chest acceptable? Is is blowing on them acceptable? You know, it's right. and this is where things can get a little tricky too. But but at the same time, uh, you know, I've seen many women healers do that, and there's no there's no thought there there's almost no second thought and even women healers who will will you know sleep with clients and and it's never really given much thought it may be seen as like well that's not really that good but it's not really that big of a deal Uh um so do you think do you think it's important that that because also in in many indigenous cultures like there often was like a coming of age training or, or something that was very gendered like you know this is this is the role that that you're taking there's certain powers there's certain gifts that that who you are not only your gender but uh you know even like one's name was given to them after a number of years when they were seen like this is who you are these are your strengths you like you're each person is different in a way um i know this is kind of a long question but <clears throat> do you think there's there's a place of importance of, of like recognizing that, that potentially uh, people's roles are different. Like the energy, uh, you know, that, that a man is going to bring in a ceremony can be very different than potentially the energy that a woman would bring. I, I was also reminded, I, I was interviewing a, a friend of mine, uh, his name is Brian James, and he brought up a really interesting point and, and, I don't know that I fully agree with it, but he does a lot of work with yoga and, and also shamanism. And he's really done this beautiful job of relating the two. Uh, but he was saying like very often the shaman would live on the outside of the village because they were always viewed as, as carrying a lot of light, but also you had to be a bit cautious of them because they had this potential for great harm too. And, you know, traditionally, even in the Amazon, there, there's there's very much this quality of light and dark. There's there's good work, there's healing work, and then there's dark work, there's harmful work. There's the curandero, the healer, and the brujo, which is the witch. Right. Or, and you know, very often the 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 witch was the the curandero of the other group. <laughs> you know, so it was always the other. They were the bad guy, and we're the good guys. Um, but 
kind of this interesting point of even this role of the curandero, it was often, you know, and it's still this way today, uh, you know, it, often when Western medicine fails, people will go to these indigenous healers, but they still have a fear of them. And, you know, a lot of that is cultural. A lot is also through the, the, the introduction of Christianity, really demonizing these people. Um, so there's that, but there's also, I think, just an inherent, an inherent feeling that if someone does have that power to heal, like, that means they have a lot of power in a way. And that power, if, if it's not checked, it can be used for harm and not, not even necessarily intentionally for harm, but much as you were saying, like maybe if the motivation just isn't clear, that power can be very intoxicating in a way. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I think we all have that. When we get into mastery, we all have that. Um, place where we have to bring things into balance and we have to become aware of it so that we can make good choices. And, and that's what I was saying about, I, mean, I think we're in agreement that um, company is stronger than willpower, as my guru used to say. <laughs> um, that, you know, if you do peer supervision or you have supervision or you're doing a communal ceremony, a lot of that, of those issues are taken care of, but I think it, and, and I think both the pasa, pasajero mm -hmm. um, and the shaman uh, need to be aware of that everybody has both and raising the awareness about that is, is really good and it's not in most cultures, it's not explicit. I, I shouldn't say most cultures, because I don't know most cultures, but um, certainly not in ours. It's not explicit that we have things that need to be balanced. There's good and bad, as you were saying, the brujo or the, uh, the shaman the but we're both and what makes what makes for good healing is to know to have good intention and to have good self-knowledge so that you can make choices to support your intention of doing the best thing you can for your client and to be around people who can help you know that brujo part of yourself and, and help you make a better choice when you, need, when you need help. I think shamans in a village were probably pretty lonely people and didn't have much of that unless they had fellow shamans in the village or fellow shamans in other villages that they could talk to. But it's a pretty lonely thing to have spiritual knowledge like that and be put in that position. I'm a spiritual leader, for example, there's a lot of spiritual leaders in, in the Western world who have fallen into that trap. And they're on a pedestal and they have nobody to talk to and everybody's bowing to them. And of course they're gonna get unbalanced. It's interesting because, um, I mean, one of the words for, for shaman is also doctor. And, and, and I think it, it's often a very good analogy. But, you know, as you said, there is often this pedestal that these people are put on. And it's not a pedestal that we would necessarily put a doctor on. I, I think we put a, you know, like a Western medical doctor on a different pedestal. But we wouldn't inherently go to them for life advice or thinking that this is an enlightened person or, you know, this person 
uh, has the ability to, to kind of know everything and, and give me these answers. And yet um, it, it seems like, you know, with this work, especially as it begins to move forward, like that's something that's really going to have to be dealt with. And it, <clears throat> it seems like the way in, in which you were describing that the process that you were trained in, not only the communal aspect was really good about that, but also this idea that like really trusting in the medicine that, that the people holding that space were, were there to guide. And, and of course they have their knowledge, they have their experience, which can come out in, in their ability to help, but, but really allowing like the, the, the process to be the one that's, that's doing the teaching. Right. I think that's really true. But I also have to say that as a therapist, I sometimes get that power differential um, deference. You know, they ask questions. It, she knows what I need to do, or she knows what is going on. And I have to be careful not to fall into the trap of giving the answers. And I don't always succeed uh, because they're the ones that have the answers. And I just have to remember that. It's one of the reasons I like brain spotting, because you just have to shut up <laughs> and hold the spot with a pointer. <laughs> have, have you developed a good way or have you seen ways of in, 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 in which one can do what you said, which is really like allowing the person to see that the, the, the knowledge is within them without I kind of in a way projecting our own thoughts or beliefs, but, you know, it's also, you know, it's interesting. Like it reminds me a lot of like Taoism where there's this idea or even in martial arts, you see it like the, the one who's really good at martial arts is the one who avoids the conflict in the first place. <laughs> like that's the highest form of the art is if you never have to practice it. And, and, and so kind of in that way of like, of, of redirecting of, of, because that also comes from a place of knowing, you know, like a, a knowing that ultimately it's more powerful if they can find the answers themselves. Mm -hmm. And, and that takes a real skill and a real mastery of being able to direct them because it's, you know, it, from my experience, it's, it's much more powerful if we can guide someone to say like, oh, I found this myself, you know, and then it's yeah. real. It's, 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 it's something that's, that's revelational, you know, truly in, in that sense of the word for them rather than, well, this is how it is. And that, that does take some skill. And it also takes knowledge of the territory. And sometimes I think there's, there's a place where we hold the transference. If, if the power transference, like you have the power, we hold that without latching onto it ourselves. <laughs> we hold it waiting for the moment when we can return it. And this is, you, you see it in me because it is in you. So, and, and that, that takes some, it's easy to hold the good transference. <laughs> um, sometimes it's hard to give it back, but it's harder to hold the bad transference and, uh, or bad, I'm just using those words, <clears throat> it's neither bad nor good, but it's difficult projections, challenging projections are harder to hold, even when they need to be held in a, in a calm and non-attached way until they can be returned for self-reflection. But both both, I think, sometimes it's important to hold, hold it without counter-transparency happening. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is just the skillfulness is usually about questions, like what, what's going on for you about that, <laughs> or things, 
things of that elk until they can get more in touch with what's going on. I think you said you were in the, the, the maps page for integrative work. Mm -hmm. Can you speak a little about that? Because that's also something that's, that's I think being seen as something that's, that's super important in this work is not just the, the, the experience itself of, of working with these medicines, but then like what follows that? And, you know, for a lot of people, they can have these, these very big experiences, like life-changing, really shifting how they view things, and then they go back to their lives, and it can often be a bit shocking, because it's like, well, I have this insight, but, like, I don't know where to begin. It's, it's almost overwhelming in a way, and then, like, what, what tools do I have to actually begin to, to, to shift things? Yes, and I have a very small practice because I run a couple of other companies and everything, but the ones that I have are, are exactly doing that, trying to, working with deep states and making that translate or integrate with ordinary life. And it's every extraordinary state of consciousness or mostly every one is it like a mini spiritual emergency? It, it's a paradigm, pers what I call a personal paradigm shift. We, we break out of some kind of a box of beliefs or needs or the way it is idea. And then we're in a new place of cognitive dissonance between the old beliefs and the new beliefs or the new experience or understanding of the way it really is, at least at that point, before the next one happens, and that one is too old. Um, <clears throat> and how does that fit into ordinary life? Or, you know, Michael Harner used to talk about dancing, dancing your experience or dancing your power animal or whatever. And, some way of bringing that experience into ordinary life that is in the tangible material world so that one, you can remember it and remember the insights and two, you can make your life express this experience. Make it different. Do you think that's something that will really become a part of, of kind of this, this, hopefully this training is, is really having an emphasis on, on the follow-up care? Because it seems like that's what MAPS is also doing, is they're, they're, they are putting a lot of I think of they're very in interested in that, yeah. Mm -hmm. MAPS has done an amazing, amazing job. And it's mostly Rick Doblin that's done that. He has done a great job of getting us to this point. But right now we have to somehow make it work in a practical way. And that's up to all of us to do that, to talk about the issues and make sure the trainings include what they need to include and expect this of our practitioners. Well, Kylea, we are, um, we're a bit over two hours. Um, Goodness, I don't yes. want to take up too much of your time. Is there, is there anything you'd like to talk about that we, we haven't gotten into? Um, I can't think of anything. We talked about a lot of things. I want, well, you know, I forgot to ask you one question I wanted to ask you. Can I do that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, you talked in the clubhouse panel about the agreements that were so important to you before ceremony to make with pasajeros. And I would like, love to know what those are mm. for you. Yeah, I, I, think, uh, I think I was mentioning that that's... <clears throat> You know, for me, I, I've really seen where that just, 
it really helps to set the stage. And, and, and I, I think f then for my work, uh, I mean, this may be an exaggeration, but I, I, I say like it, it kind of cuts out 90% of, of the work that I would have to do. And, and it, so I think it's, it's really important um, because you, also, as you were saying, like when we are in these extraordinary states, uh, we're very open, we're very sensitive and the rational mind isn't necessarily working at its peak level. <laughs> so, you know, I found, you know, for example, like, like one of the, uh, I call them agreements. And, and so uh, these are things that, <clears throat> that I think most of them, if not all of them, <clears throat> are in a, like a workshop agreement that we have people read through and sign. So they've already signed it, which I think is important because even before they come, it's like, Hey, th these are the agreements we have. And, um, and, you know, it's up to you. Like you don't have to come. There's other places too, but for the work we do, this is, this is how we do it. And, and, and this is why it's important. Um, within that workshop agreement, we don't necessarily speak about why it's important and so I think that's, that is important to also explain a why, you know, like why are these agreements in place? Um, so like, like some of them, and, and I would usually do this uh, like in the introduction talk uh, when, we're, mm -hmm. when we're meeting with the guests and talking about the ceremony and how it's gonna run. Uh, so for example, one would be, um, like only getting off your mat because people are on mats throughout the, the whole ceremonial process, like only getting off your mat to go to the bathroom. And that may seem like a kind of obvious one. Like, of course, if you have to go to the bathroom, you can go if, if you need help, we'll help you. Um, but the reason that that for me is very important is because it's, it can be very common under that effect to for example, if my neighbor is going through a really difficult experience and she's crying or he's having a demonic possession and you know, whatever, screaming, a lot of people have that natural desire of like, you know, I want to help them. So I, I go to the mat and I, I start comforting them and maybe singing to them, you know, whatever, whatever that, that impulse is. But the truth is we you know, we, as you said, like, we never really know what that person is experiencing. We, we may think we do because they're crying and therefore we assume that they're sad. And so I go to comfort them. But then the next day I find out from that person that they were having an ecstatic experience and something truly profound. And by me going to them, I actually ended up interrupting that process or, you know, someone's going through seemingly a really difficult experience and, and I, I go to my neighbor and, and I start, you know, trying to comfort them. And it turns out the next day that they thought I was a demon and I was doing black magic on them and I was harming them. And even though that wasn't my intention, I've entered their space into, into a reality that, that I don't know what I'm getting into. And so you know, by having a really clear guideline that, that, that we don't interfere in other people's processes, then it's much easier for me than as the facilitator, if that person, because, you know, even consciously, subconsciously, they already know that. So that's already like a seed that's been implanted there. So that cuts out most of that because they, they already know like, okay, I've made this agreement. And, and I also get like a, you know, verbal agreement, which I think is more important than just a written agreement. Like I, I agree to this. And then it's, you know, it's spoken, it's the word, there, there's a power in that. Mm -hmm. But then also in that ceremonial space, when one is under the influence, if one does go to their neighbor, it's much easier for me as the facilitator to come to that person and say, hey, you know, Kylia, remember you made this agreement, right. you agreed that you wouldn't go to this person. And almost inevitably that's enough to bring them back. Yeah. But if I didn't have that agreement and I started getting into some explanation of, oh, well, we don't really know what's happening and maybe they're not taking in any of that. You know, no. it's, it's way too much information. All they're thinking about is I have to go help this person. 
and 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 then it it takes a lot of time a lot of effort uh to deal with that person and there may be you know 10 other things going on at that moment too so right um so that's where i find those those, those agreements are, are are super important and you know some are some are agreements that have or policies that we've seen. I mean, they're all things that we've seen are, are really conducive to the work that's being done. Like, how do we do this in the best way? And, you know, sometimes people aren't going to like all those rules, but as long as we get an agreement, then we all realize that we're on the same page. Um, you know, there's, there's other ceremonies where people can go and go to other people. And it's not that that's inherently bad, you know, that may be okay. But in the space that, that we're working in, that's not the most conducive way to allow us to do the work that we're doing. Um, you know, maybe if we had 50 facilitators, that would be possible. But, you know, even then, it, it still wouldn't be the best idea. Um, so, and, and then I think the other thing is really explaining like why those things are, because that's, it, it, I think it's much more powerful when you give people a reason rather than just saying like, you can't, you can't talk to anyone. <laughs> I think that can be very triggering to people like, well, um, I want to, or what if this, or what if this, but if it's explained, you know, why, then I think people can really understand it. And, and then it's, it's much easier for them to, to, to make that agreement. And, and, and then, you know, some things are personal. And I think that's where you said like that dance, like different people work differently. So, you know, maybe one person is okay with a, a certain way of ceremony running. Um, you know, there's ceremonies where they really emphasize silence, um, you know, not, not talking, not singing, not making a, a lot of noise. And, and I think that's really beneficial. There, there may be other ceremonies where people encourage people to sing. And, and I think like you were saying, that's where the, the intention, the motivation is, is, really, is, is really vital. I, I often think of, of like sports matches, like in tennis, there's an agreement that there's silence. You know, that's everyone has agreed to that. And, and, so when the guy, you know, goes up to serve and he's about to hit and someone from the audience yells out, then the, the umpire has to say, you know, no, like <laughs> silence and redo, redo the match because that's distracting to the person then. But in a football match, everyone's screaming, everyone's yelling. There's no <laughs> agreement for silence. And yet the quarterback is throwing the ball fine. You know, yeah. the only difference is we made an agreement that, that that's how it's going to be. And, and so if that agreement is there, then, you know, it also has to be followed. And, and that really, I think, creates then a, a space that's, that's conducive for these things. So, yeah, in, in my work, I've just seen that, that being really clear in the beginning, it, it just saves, uh, you know, so much, so much work, so much uh, headache. And, and in the end, it benefits everyone. Um, because there's, there, there's this, <laughs> you know, probably, as, as you know, I mean, in these altered states, there can be a lot of chaos. And so trying to create order amongst that chaos is, is vital <laughs> so that, you know, everyone can be, you know, ultimately safe. That's, yeah. that's, that's the most important thing that people are safe because within that safety, they can go very deeply into the medicine. But if that safety isn't there, that's right. Then it's very difficult to fully release into that experience. I mean, there's already <laughs> so many barriers in the way, our, our mind, our ego, our traumas, our fears, our anxieties. So if you add on top of that, you know, like real life worries, it's, it makes it very difficult. Yeah, and the holotropic breath work did a lot of that too. We would have people raise their hands in group with, you know, with all the four or five agreements that we had to make, including one, you can't leave. <clears throat> we'll that, that's through. another one. Like, that's a really common one is that, that that's another agreement I have people is that, again, with the exception of going to the bathroom, you, you can't leave the Maloka. And again, at, at, at first, when that's first spoken, sometimes it can seem a little harsh, like, well, you're trying to control me and I'm mm -hmm. a free person and... <laughs> But when you explain, like, again, under that state, you know, all sorts of things can happen. We, we can think, like, I'm at one with the universe, and I need to go into the jungle, and, and 
climb a tree and you know reach out to the heavens or i need to find a jaguar and, and give him a hug because he's my my power <laughs> spirit and you know the reality is for a untrained person the jungle at night is is not the best place to be wandering around especially if you're under the effect of a, of a very strong plant and we don't have i don't and the team doesn't have the manpower to follow every single person around the jungle to make sure that they're okay and again if our primary concern is that people are safe like we we can't do that so we have to have a very clear rule for the duration of the ceremony you stay within the maloka and, and again i think when people hear that like they understand that and and there's going to be people who want to run away you know it's too much Absolutely. It's, uh, I, I can't do it i need to go into the jungle but again if we made that agreement it's much much easier to remind them of that um True. yeah okay well thank you very much for that and it's really really been a pleasure having this conversation you ask a lot of good questions <laughs> Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you so much for, for coming on. You have a, a beautiful quality about you. And I, I really enjoyed uh, doing the, the, the previous conversation together. And uh, thank you so much for coming on. And if, if people are interested in, in learning more about you or working with you, is, is, uh, is there a way they can do that via your website? or? You know, my practice is pretty full, but um, what I'm really working on now is, is teaching inner ethics and teaching and training programs and at some point, I want to teach people to, to actually teach it, but they can read my book, which is here. Mm. Oh, it's my thing is mirrored. It's the ethics of caring, and it looks like that. <laughs> and can people find that uh, on your website or? You can find it seller. on Amazon and it's in Kindle and it's also in Spanish mm. as La Etica. I have the Spanish version here too so I can see it. Again, it's La Etica something, but it's... Mm. De los cuidados profesionales. <laughs> you can read mirrored writing. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. It's, it's been a pleasure. I've, I've really enjoyed speaking with you and uh, I wish you all the best. And um, I hope we get a chance to interact again, whether it's in person or doing another interview together Bye. at some point in the future. I do too. All right, everybody. That is it. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Kalia. Uh, I really enjoyed speaking with her. She has a beautiful quality and uh, she's been doing this work for a long time. And I think she has a lot to share and especially her work with ethics, I, I think is really important in this field, especially as it begins to grow and, uh, and move forward. So thank you all for the support. Uh, if you're able to help this podcast financially, uh, Patreon is a really good way. Um, it's a subscription service for as little as a dollar a month. You can subscribe. There's different tiers you can sign up for, and it gives you some really nice added benefits, things like early access to shows, bonus material, Q&A. Um, it's a really big help to me to continue to bring on these guests. Uh, it's one of my favorite things when I hear the little Patreon uh, bell go off that I have a new... Uh, uh, person contributing. So to all the people who have done that, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Um, there's also the ability to direct donate via PayPal. I'll put a link to both of those in the show notes. And if you're not able to do that, um, going on YouTube, subscribing to the show, turning on the notification bell, liking the video, that's a really big help in getting the show out to a bigger audience. And then with the audio version, uh, going on Apple Podcasts, subscribing to the show, and leaving a starred rating and a short review, that's a really big help. To all the people who have done that, thank you very much. So I think that's it. Uh, I'm not sure of the order of the following guests, um, but as always, I hope to continue to bring on some really fascinating people. So thank you all for tuning in, and I will see you all on the next episode.
Doom. Mm-hmm.